What is up, church family? Welcome. Glad you're here this morning. If you've had the best week of your life or even just an average week, uh, I'm glad you're here. Let's praise Jesus for that. But if you've had the worst week of your life, I'm also glad you're here uh, because now is the time to worship through that. And I promise that you will not regret. You will leave your feeling totally different than you did when you came in. And uh, so let's praise Jesus together, shall we?
rushing wind, winding like a fountain, moving every mountain. Great Jehovah, the architect, Alpha and Omega, holy way maker. Unto the great I am, with everything I have, unto the great
Unto the great I am, I'm singing how great is your name. Unto the great I am, with everything I have. Unto the great I am, I'm singing how great is your name. How great is your name, Jesus. Jesus, you are holy. You are sovereign, you are Lord, you are King. Jesus, your name is mighty, your name is powerful. Your name is the name above every other name. Jesus, this morning I pray that we would have undivided hearts, that we would have hearts that are fully surrendered to you. Let's just take a minute, church, if there's anything in your heart that is taking your attention off of Christ, would you just surrender that right now? Surrender that at the feet of Jesus. Jesus, we give you everything. We give you all of us. We give you our whole hearts. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill us till we're overflowing. Fill us with abundance. I pray that we wouldn't seek for fulfillment or joy or satisfaction anywhere besides you and you alone. You are the only one who can fulfill us. You're the only one who can sustain us. So Jesus, we lay down our distractions at your feet and we run to you. We run into the arms of the loving Father who is perfect, who can make us whole again. We love you so much, Jesus, and we continue to give you all the praise and all the glory this morning. It's in your name I pray, amen. my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for and now my life is yours and I will sing of your goodness forevermore worthy is your name
give you everything So be exalted now in the heavens As your glory fills this place You alone deserve our praise You're the name above all names Be exalted now in the heavens As your glory And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on the earth. What a beautiful picture of generosity. Our God, Jesus was literally slaughtered his blood was shed on behalf of you and I that we could be plucked out of darkness and placed into his kingdom, into his marvelous light. And without him, we deserve death. But Jesus' beautiful sacrifice gave us life and life abundantly. So what is our response? What should our response be? Nothing short of being all in. Nothing short of of giving him our lives and, and everything in our lives as he has done for us. And so uh, what does this look like practically? What does generosity look like for us? And as a church, generosity begins at, with partnership here where many of us give of our tithes and offerings. And, and what that those monies do is help us to be able to reach the kingdom with the gospel not only in greater Portland, but in the state of Maine and, and throughout the world. And, and so that's a practical way that we can partner with him. And if you are a partner, you know that you can give online and you can give in the boxes up back. And, um, but if you're just visiting here, we, we don't want you to give. We want you to just enjoy uh, the worship today and being part of the family here. But fill out one of these Connect cards that we might get to know you and so another way that you can uh, show generosity today is that our cafe out there, we have Baked with Love, our uh, business out there that's been partnering with us. And it's a special day tomorrow because tomorrow marks one year that they have been partnering with us here at East Point. So we're so grateful for them. And we love Heath, Heath and Liz and, and, and all their, those that work with them. And so go out there before you leave today and empty out their their um their shelves so they can leave empty-handed today so so let's go to the lord everyone 
So, Father God, I just thank you for this time, and I thank you for your sweet spirit that's present in this house today. I thank you. This is a spirit of love. Your Holy Spirit is a spirit of love that you have for your people, your love for the children that you created and for those who st are still yet to be in your kingdom, Father. And we're so grateful here at East Point that we get to be a part of all you're doing in the world. And we're just a little piece of what you're doing in the world. But it's such a joy and it's such an honor and such a blessing. And so I pray today, Father, that um, as we just continue worship with the word, that you would touch hearts today. You'd open eyes today. That you'd open ears today that your presence would go forth in this place like never before, Father. And may you be glorified with, with what is done and said, with every dollar that's given today, with every um, generous, kind word or prayer that's offered to you today. And for every heart that says, I'm all in, may you be glorified, Jesus, today. And we'll give you all the honor and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we sit down, we're going to turn and greet each other. And would you find someone you don't know and, and tell them your name? Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, East Point. It's so good to see all of you. Uh, privileged to be here. Wow. A couple of you are like, wow, this is exciting. Okay. <laughs> hey, we're going we're gonna to start something a little different today. We're going to take a moment and we're all going to catch our breath because if you're anything like me, there are things that are waiting for you outside of these walls that are going to try to take your attention while you're here. And there's a great uh, devotional app that you can download called Lectio 365. Highly encourage you to get it. And at the beginning of every devotional, they say this. They say, I pause to be still, to recenter my scattered senses upon the presence of God. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to take a moment, so I want everybody to just close your eyes right in your seat. Close your eyes, and if you need to, open up your hands in front of you, and we're just going to be still. We're going to slow down, and we're going to recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. Come, Holy Spirit. We invite you into this room, Holy Spirit. Would you allow us, would you show us grace so that we can focus and not miss 
what you may have for us this morning. So recenter our senses, bring our mind to you this morning so that we may encounter the presence of the living God. Come and speak to us. We are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are going to be in Daniel chapter 6 today. Daniel chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles or if you have the Bible app on your phone, go ahead and turn to Daniel chapter 6. It'll be on the screens as well, but I want to start. I just want to read this verse to kind of set the tone of where we're going today. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. It says, But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. And he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I, um, I am an uncle, and I've got three nieces, all under the age of four, okay? And it, it, for any of you, listen, being an uncle is just a lot of fun. Okay, we get to have a ton of fun. We get uh, cute videos sent to us when we get to see our nieces. Like what I do is I sneak them candy. I teach them the words that their parents probably don't want them to know. And then, and then what I do at the end of it, I get them all riled up. And then I say, here you go, mom and dad. I send them home and I leave, right? That is one of my favorite things about being an uncle is mom and dad, you've got to deal with all the rest. But what I want to do is I want to show you, and we get these cute videos every once in a while, and I want to show you just a moment of joy. This video I got a couple weeks ago. Is that not... Just one of the cutest things you've ever seen in your life. I just melted, right? I, now, here's the thing. Do you think that her parents sat her down after they watched Frozen, which you guys know what that is, right? Let it go, Frozen. We could all probably sing it together right now if we wanted, okay? Do you think they sat my little niece down after and said, hey, now here's how you sing, let it go. Okay, we're going to walk you through the lyrics. We're going to give you the, the words. We're going to make sure you know how to sing this. No, they, they did not do that. What, what happened is this is the movie of choice in the plumber house, and it is on repeat all the time, and this song has just become part of who our niece is. How many of you guys know who Peppa Pig is? Peppa Pig, show of hands. Okay, this is amazing. Now, if you don't know who Peppa Pig is, she is a British pig uh, that teaches people how to be nice or something like that, okay? So Peppa Pig, uh, this is amazing. Did you know in 2021, The Guardian, so an online article like journaling company, uh, The Guardian published an article about how parents had begun to report that their children who watched the beloved British pig had also began to develop a British accent, this is not a joke. Kids stopped saying tomato and they started saying tomato. They stopped saying zebra and they started to say zebra. Not, I was actually sitting with a friend this past week and he, he was like, oh my gosh, my kids did that. They actually stopped saying we're going on vacation and they started to say we're going on holiday. Like this is real. And my question is, has Peppa Pig been brainwashing our kids on purpose? Like, are the English coming back trying to reclaim what was once theirs? No, of course not. These kids, much like my niece, were being formed and shaped by what they consumed. And my point in all of this is that what we consume, passively or intentionally, is shaping and forming us at all times. What has your attention slowly takes over your heart. There's an author, his name's Tim Huang, and he wrote the book Subprime Attention Crisis, where he looks at how advertising affects our lives. And he said this, advertising's ultimate goal is to shape the recipient's behavior or perception in some way. That's the goal. The Dunkin' Donuts down the street wants you to buy a coffee and a donut. 
Those ads on Instagram, they want you to buy that product. And with all of these things that are fighting to shape our desires, it can be really hard to look like Jesus. It can feel like we're swimming upstream, being pushed to and fro by what culture says is right and wrong. What, what's the new fad? What's, what's acceptable? What is truth? How should I parent? How should I love people? How should I do this? And the world has a lot to say about these things. And then there's Jesus saying, come and follow me, and I will teach you my ways. And we feel this tension because what Jesus wants so often, it goes against what we're hearing so often, and we're feeling pressed on us by culture. And rather than fight, because the reality is fighting takes more energy, rather than fight, we just give in and we allow ourselves to be shaped by the Peppa Pigs of the world. So what are we to do in a world that's doing everything it can to steal our affection and our gaze off of our creator and onto the created? Well, I believe the prophet Daniel gives us this beautiful model. So Daniel and the Jewish people have been taken captive by the Babylonians. Babylonians have come in and they've taken over Jerusalem. They've they've taken the Jewish people captive. And now there are Jewish people living in exile under their rule. Now, the Babylonians, if you don't know much about their nation, they were a violent nation. They never shied away from war. In fact, they they looked for opportunities to go to war with other nations because that meant they would have a good chance to expand their own nation. They were also a polytheistic nation, meaning that they worship multiple gods all throughout their kingdom. And then it's in this culture we find the man named Daniel, a man who loved God with all of his heart, but everywhere he looked, God was being minimized and Babylon was being emphasized. And yet, if you remember our scripture from earlier, it said he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. See, what we see from Daniel is a heart fully devoted to the Lord. This is the first. We we meet Daniel as a heart fully devoted to the Lord. And in fact, Daniel was doing quite well in Babylon. The king had chosen Daniel to be one of his top advisors, which then made his other advisors jealous. And so they plotted to then kill Daniel. Listen to this, Daniel chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Then the other administrators... And high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. Listen to this next part. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. Is that true of your life? Why? Because he was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So they plan to entrap Daniel through his devotion. They say, okay, we're not going to find any fault in how he lives, but the way that we can get him is we know he is devoted and he loves his God. And that's how we'll get him. And that's exactly what they do. Verses 6 through 9, it says, So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors. Then we skip down. It goes uh, middle of verse 7. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. And now, your majesty, issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed. An official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So, King Darius signed the law. Not only did they know that Daniel's devotion would be his downfall, they knew it would take less than a month. They said, give us 30 days and we'll get him. Because we know how devoted he is. We know how faithful he is. So I have a question for you this morning. Why are you here? Why are you here sitting in this room right now? Are you here? Because this is what we do on Sundays. 
We go to church. We load up in the car. We go to church. Grandma takes us. Mom takes us. Dad takes us. I'm here because this is what my family's always. We go to church. Are you here because the church makes you feel good? You walk in, you're like, oh, I just feel better. Are you here because you wanted a break from your kids for an hour and a cup of coffee and a nap? Yes, I see you up there on the balcony. You need to wake up. Why are you here? Because if we can be honest, I think we want God's heart fully devoted to serving us without devoting our hearts to fully serving him. I think we want what God offers, but we say, "Eh, no, no, no. If I need to check some boxes to get enough change in my pocket so that when I need something, I can use that change to then buy what God can do for me, that's what I'm going to do. So we show up at church, we read our Bible, we pray sometimes, we, maybe we even join a group, but it becomes less about worshiping him out of our love and adoration for him, and it becomes more about trying to earn enough of his good graces so that he will just do what we want. If your heart posture is anything less than pure devotion and worship to the Lord, my question this morning is then why are you doing it? Does that sound like a loving relationship? See, Jesus spells out what devotion is in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. Like if you, if there, you come to Jesus and you're like, but Jesus, I'm going to bring these six things with me. But Jesus, I'm going to go back. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep this. I'm going to keep this. But Jesus, I need this in my life. I need to have control over this. Jesus says it's not going to work. That's not a life of surrender. That's not a life of devotion. Jesus says, if you want to know what devotion is, if you want to know what it's like to follow me, he says, but if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You will find new life. You will find everything you've been searching for. Devotion to Jesus is giving your entire life to him. It's it's letting go of your career. It's letting go of your kids' sports schedules. It's letting go of your finances. It's letting go of your calendar. It's letting go of your sexuality. It's letting go of your time. It's letting go of control. It's surrender. That's where devotion comes. And then we we come to this place of of surrender and devotion of following Jesus. We come to this place and Paul writes to the early church in Ephesus in chapter 4 and he says, when we come to this place, then we will no longer be immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We won't be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. We won't be influenced and and swayed by what we see on TikTok. We won't be influenced and swayed by what we see as we go through YouTube. We won't be influenced and swayed as we go on Fox News and CNN and we go through the political season. We won't be swayed as we go throughout our life and we have different friends and family telling us these things. Paul says, no, no, no. If you want to live a life unswayed, then be devoted and surrendered followers of Jesus and give him everything. That's what it takes. And it's in this place of devotion and surrender we begin to build out rhythms of to, to practice just living in God's presence each moment of every day. And what we're going to call this today is counterformation. Counterformation, creating daily rhythms to practice the presence of God, just experiencing and encountering. God every day. Now, let's go back to Daniel. So verse 9, it says that King Darius signed the law. You will not pray to anybody but me. Verse 10, what happens? But when Daniel learned that the new law had been signed, he went home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks To his God. Daniel sees this new law and he says, You know what? Time to pray. Just as he always had. This wasn't new. Not only did he he go upstairs and pray, we even get a clue to what kind of prayer he did pray. And it wasn't this prayer of, God, please save us from this heathen nation. Come back soon. We I can't do this anymore. I can't live in Babylon without you. I can't live under this rule. Save me from these heathens. That was not the prayer that Daniel prayed. 
we get a clue that Daniel prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. And if you want to practice counterformation in your life on a daily basis, practice gratitude and thanksgiving every single day. What have you thanked God for today? Since you woke up, what have you thanked him for? Because we live in a time where we have a lot that people are telling us we have to be ungrateful for. How many of you have heard of the fish ale, alewife? An alewife? Have you guys heard of these? Okay, like eight of you. Great. This will be perfect. So eight of you, listen up. Um, I'd never heard of them either. I, I didn't know what these were. And then Pastor Graham was telling me about them. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. So basically every May through June, about 70,000 alewife fish who live in Casco Bay embark on an 11-mile journey from the bay up the Presumpscot River to Highland Lake. Okay, we have a little picture of it. This is kind of their mic, whatever, their, their journey. Okay, starting Casco Bay, 11 miles up. Their journey from Casco Bay to Highland Lake is tough. Okay, if you guys know anything about that river, I mean, there's little waterfalls, there's obviously birds and, and, and predators, there's, there's other dangers, there's, and then the whole time they're swimming upstream. They're working against the current, but swimming against the current, the alewives press on devoted to their goal of reaching Highland Lake. That is what counterformation is. Instead of being formed by the strong current of our culture or our friends or our political climate, counterformation is swimming against the current with the goal being complete and utter devotion to the person and ways of Jesus. That's what we swim upstream for. Daniel, think about this. Daniel was bombarded every single day by Babylonian propaganda. Like, they were doing everything they could to make Daniel look more Babylonian. And yet his devotion to the Lord never changed. He was committed to encountering the presence of God daily. In fact, his devotion was so well known that the advisors knew after they instituted the law, they said, we know where we can find him. Listen to verse 11. Then the officials went together. To Daniel's house, and they found him praying and asking God for help. Paul uh, wrote to the early church in Rome. It's a city that was the very center of the known world. It was filled with pagan religions, and it was the center of trade, and a melting pot of all these different cultures, a city where sexuality was fluid, and there was nothing off limits. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and he gives us the definition for counterformation. He says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable, this is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. But I love that Paul starts this by saying, I plead with you. Like, I know this is gonna be hard. I know this is gonna be really hard, but I plead with you because I know there's something better. I know there's something better than how you have been living. And then he goes on, how do we do this? Well, we, we do not copy the behavior and customs of this world, but instead we're transformed and we allow God to change or renew our minds. That's the very essence of counterformation. And then when we live this way, people start to notice because a different life is a noticed life. Because the story goes on with Daniel. And the king is brought to his attention that Dave, Daniel has violated this law and the king has no choice but to exercise judgment on him. And so in verse 16, it says, At last the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of lions. And the king said to him, Listen to this. This is the king of Babylon. 
said, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. And then Daniel's thrown in. And the king wrestles all night because he's worried about his friend Daniel. And it says the next morning the king gets up. He runs to the front of the den of lions. He rolls the stone back and he yells down to Daniel. He says, was your God, whom you serve, faithfully able to rescue you? And it reminds me of this moment with Jesus where the disciples show up at the tomb and they're like, did it work? Is he really who he said he is? And now we have King Darius coming to the front of the t- this, this den of lions and he says, is your God who he said he is? I just imagine this pause. And then up from the den of lions, Daniel answers, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, for I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. And then the king pulls Daniel out and establishes a new decree based on everything he has seen in Daniel's life. Remind you, this is the king of Babylon. And he says this, I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his rule will never end. He rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. And he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lion's den. This is the king of Babylon, but he comes to this point where Daniel's radical life of devotion was so potent and the Lord was so unceasingly faithful that the king of Babylon comes and he says, this has to be true. This has to be the one true God. We worship all these gods, but I am learning they are false, they are fake. No God compares to the God of Daniel. And you will find that in your own life. You may worship other gods. You may try this. You may try that. Here's what you will find. Nothing will bring you satisfaction. Nothing will fulfill you until you come to the point where you say, I will worship the one true God, the God of Abraham, the God of Daniel, the father of Jesus, the God we serve this morning. Nothing will bring you to a place of peace until you surrender to him. A life devoted to practicing counterformation through the ways of Jesus will attract curiosity from others, but it will also attract persecution. Because yes, King Darius was curious and it changed his life, but the advisors hated him. Because people will notice and they will start to ask questions because they might not like how you live. They may not like how you pray or the truth that you believe, or who you pray to. And it will be in those moments when you are noticed or persecuted, you will have to ask the question, is Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? And you remember earlier, Jesus says, take up your cross. He says, give up your lives and follow me and you will find it. There was a moment where he had all these followers and he he tells them that. And it says that after that moment, after Jesus said this hard teaching, a bunch of his followers left. He left him. Because for them, it wasn't worth it. And Jesus turns and he looks at his 12 closest friends, the disciples, and he says, will you leave me too? And Peter, Peter looks at Jesus and he says, where would I go? To whom would I go? Jesus, you have all, like, I can't imagine going anywhere else, Jesus. Devotion is getting to the point in your walk with Jesus where you look and you say, where else would I go? You're everything. You are everything I need. And I I, want to worship you for the rest of my life. Where else would I go? Now, all of this sounds impossible. I I get it. Guys, I'm a human being too. I live in this world. (laughs) We talk about this and it's like, man, this sounds really hard. And I promise you, it will be. 
If you try to do it on your own, no amount of striving and Bible reading and prayer or worship that is fueled by your own strength will get you to a place where you're living a life formed by the ways of Jesus. But thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit has been given to those that have chosen to follow Jesus and surrendered their life to him. And Jesus calls him our helper, our advocate. And now he lives within us. The Spirit of God lives within those who have chosen to follow Jesus. And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 to 24, Paul says, listen, stop working against the Spirit and start working with him. He says, since you have heard about Jesus and have turned, have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception, and instead let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature. That, that Greek word right there, put on, is like putting on a jacket, putting on a coat. Envelop yourself in this new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Have a willingness to surrender and a willingness to be renewed. And once you come to the place of full devotion, you can start to create these these daily rhythms to practice counterformation that's fueled by the Holy Spirit, which then leads you to a life that is noticed by others. So some ways that we can do this. The first is you can you need to sit down and grab a journal or grab a note on your phone, whatever, and you need to do a formation audit. Okay, my wife's an accountant, so I'm stealing one of her nerd words, audit. Okay, sorry to all the other accountants in the room. Um, Formation audit. And you need to write down what is shaping you. What's forming your thoughts? What are you allowing to shape and form your life? You need to write it all down. Parents, I'm going to ask you this. What are you allowing your kids to be shaped by? Parents, do you even know what's forming your kids as they sit and watch YouTube for three hours? Instagram's shaping us. Netflix is shaping us. YouTube is shaping us. Coworkers, friends, they're all shaping us. How about this one? Our family that we grew up in, it shaped us. It formed us. So sit down and write these things out. And then the next step Allow the spirit to prune what is not healthy so that what healthy, what is healthy can grow. And each of us in this room, we have different things that we need to prune. We we got different things that the Holy Spirit's asking us to trim off our life. What are the lengths and the depths that you're willing to allow the Holy Spirit into your heart to reveal what needs to be pruned? And it's really hard, but it's only through this pruning that more growth can take place. And now let's, let's look at some developing some daily rhythms. So the first is prayer. It says that Daniel prayed three times a day. Now, my question when I was reading this is, did Daniel really only pray three times a day? And I just did a lot of study on this. And I, I don't think Daniel was just like, all right, three times, God, I'm done. Morning, evening, afternoon, like that's all you get, God, three times. I think what we see with Daniel is actually a posture of unceasing prayer that was grounded with three physical moments where he stopped, prayed, and seeked after the encounter and the, the presence of God. That's what I think we see with Daniel's life. And I hear from, guys, I've, I've been a pastor nine years. I hear from people all the time. I don't hear from God. I don't hear from him. And it makes me think of Dallas Willard who wrote the book, Hearing God. And he said this, if you find yourself in a position of saying, God has never spoken to me, you should then ask, why should God speak to me? What am I doing in life that would make speaking to me a reasonable thing for him to do? Why should he talk to you? I'd go one step further. What space are you giving him to speak? That leads to the second practice, silence and solitude. I tried to practice this on the way in this morning. I was like, you know what? For my, dri- for my drive, I'm not going to turn on a, pod- a Christian podcast. I'm not going to turn on Christian worship. I'm just going to sit here and be silent. And guess what? It was really, really hard. <laughs> because my mind is so conditioned to be distracted. It's hard to hear from God when we do all the talking. 
and we don't allow ourselves space to just sit quietly and listen. So create some space throughout your day. I don't, maybe it's in the morning, afternoon, in your car. I, I don't know what it is. Create some space to listen. Be silent. Third is fasting. Creating physical hunger is an opportunity to increase spiritual hunger when it's done intentionally. And I know this, is, this can kind of be a complex thing. There's a lot of different ways to do this. But I would encourage you, if you've never done this before, man, just give up lunch this week. And instead of eating during that hour, spend it in prayer, praying for a neighbor. Or praying for your city. Or praying for a move of God in this state. Or praying and confessing and repenting of all the things that you've done in your life. Whatever it is, take that hour and pray. Develop spiritual Hunger. The, the, the next thing is Sabbath. Did you guys know? I couldn't believe this. 37% of Americans take fewer than seven days off a year. I want you to think about that statistic. 37% of people in the United States vacation less than seven days a year. You know what that tells me? We are really, really bad at resting. Because we're busy and we're proud of it. Sabbath is intentionally giving a day devoid of any work back to the Lord. And that's something Jesus has invited us into. It's an intentional day where no work is done and we are reminded that we are not in control. God is. It reminds us that we are not at the center of the universe. He is. And I know some of you right now in the back of your mind are like, well, Brandon, if you could just see my calendar, you would know I don't have time for this. And you're you're right, I haven't seen your calendar. My question to those of you with that response is, are you distracting and busying yourself right into spiritual oblivion? Like, are you so desperate and so busy to remain in control? Your calendar has no room for God to move even if he wanted to. Devotion to Jesus comes from a life surrendered to him. And one of the best ways to practice this sort of counterformation in our lives is through willfully giving a day back to him and trusting that our life will continue on without us at the steering wheel. It'll keep going. Lastly, man, develop a rhythm of reading God's word but then I'll take it one step further. You actually need to obey what his word says. Like you need to obey it. Don't miss the part of reading where we read and we learn about who God is and how he's loved us and what he's given for us. And his, we, this, this book tells us all about how devoted God is to us. How he gave everything for us. And then we read it and it's like, oh, that's great. I gave him an hour on a Sunday. I read through Daniel chapter six. Great. No, James, the book of James tells us that if we read this or if we hear God's word and then we don't do it, we're just foolish. What's the point? I would ask again, why are you here? Just start in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Read through John, open up the Bible app on your phone, find a reading plan. There's so many, anxiety, depression, parenting, whatever it may be, and there's a reading plan. Just start reading, start small and start reading. Now, as we come to the end of this, I think it's really important to say this because there is one thing that has the potential to derail our walk with Jesus all the time, and that thing is comparison. It's comp- listen, You're not me. I'm not you. You are not your neighbor. You are not that person that you're like, man, they're way more spiritual than I am. I could never do anything. I could never be like them. I could never live like them. No, stop trying to live a life that is not yours. Run the race that God has put in front of you. Stop trying to run your neighbor's race. Run the race that God has called and equipped you to run and stop comparing yourself to others because when we get in that mindset, we lose what God is trying to do specifically in our lives. 
don't let comparison knock you off the path that he has set before you. There is no microwavable version of transformation and counterformation. It's a journey the Holy Spirit guides us on for the rest of our lives. And it starts with devotion and surrender. And this journey, it wouldn't be possible without what Jesus has done for us. And so to that end, we're going to pause and we're going to take communion together. And see, communion is a special remembrance, celebration for those that have chosen to follow Jesus, to remember Jesus' sacrifice and partake in the Lord's Supper or communion. And if you didn't grab one of these on the way in and you're a follower of Jesus, go and grab one right now. There's buckets on the back walls. But before we take communion together, here's what we're going to do. We're going to examine our hearts in a posture of surrender. And maybe throughout this service, the Holy Spirit has just been putting things on your mind like, hey, you need to give this up. Or maybe there's some sin in your life. There's this, diso- this way you've been disobeying God or you've li- been living selfishly, not surrendered. And the Holy Spirit's been prompting this, been bubbling up in your heart. He's like, hey, you need to ask for forgiveness for this. Whatever it might be, we're just going to take a minute. We're just going to pray. We're going to confess, we're going to repent, and we're going to surrender. on the night when he was betrayed the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it and then he broke it in pieces and said this is my body which is given for you do in remembrance of me take and eat in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Take and drink. Thank you, Jesus. God, we come before you and we surrender. And there are people of all different walks of life, spiritual walks of life in this room. God, people that have been following you for a long time that just need to get back to the devotion, that just need to surrender again because they've tried to take the reins. They've tried to take control. God, I pray this morning you would remind them of your devotion to them, the joy and the privilege we have to worship you every single day, that you are worthy of all of our adoration, all of our praise, all of our worship, all of our thanksgiving, in the good times, in the bad, in the, in the hard cultural moments that we find ourselves in, in the hard family situations we find ourselves in, you are still worthy. God, I pray this morning for those that might be spiritually curious like King Darius. God, I pray that this morning they would realize and recognize and encounter the presence of the living God. That they would see there is no other God. There is no other creator that there is no other Savior except Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave everything for them. And would they turn from their selfishness, would they turn from their sin, surrender and call Jesus Lord today. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, that you did not leave us as orphans, but rather you gave us your Spirit to live within us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
is uh, nothing else. Nothing else. Just Jesus. Just more of him. And so I pray this morning you feel encouraged. I pray you feel challenged. And I pray that you encounter the presence of God this morning. And there are, uh, we're, we're just really thankful and feel blessed that you guys came and worshiped with us this morning. Uh, there are a few ways we want to connect with you. Um, men, we have something coming up for you October 26th from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. right here at the church at the point. Uh, there will be food, worship, and a teaching for guys at our men's conference. And so we would love to have you there. And then ladies, we have a women's conference as well the following weekend from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. right here at the point. Uh, I hear there's a guest speaker. Uh, there's going to be worship, and there's just going to be a time to seek Jesus uh, together. And then we also, uh, Lighthouse Church, uh, the church that my wife and I will be planting downtown Portland, we are doing a prayer and worship night this Saturday, October 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. And it will actually be in our future church home, the East End Community Center. And so if you'd like to learn more about that or you're interested in any of these events you want to learn, come out to the hub, which is where you can RSVP and ask any questions you might have. Um, lastly, maybe you came into this room and the Holy Spirit's just been working in your heart. Or maybe you need healing physically or mentally or spiritually, emotionally. Or maybe you just need someone to minister to you, just wrap their arms around you and just love on you. Our prayer team would love to take some time to pray with you and pray for you and minister to you out on the turf. They would love to meet you out there. But we're so glad that you guys joined us this morning. Thank you for being here. Go in peace in Jesus' name.